Well, welcome back. This is our functions and program structure video. This is just the introduction to this chapter and series of videos because we've got a lot to talk about this time and in this section. We are going to get into functions and how to break a program apart into functions. So far we've only had one function and that's main. And main is just a function like any other. Other all the same rules apply to main and to all the other functions. Main is only special because that's where the operating system knows to start. It starts the program, the C program that we've written, at the function named main. So that's the only difference between it and uh, the others that we're going to look at. We're going to look at how functions return things, how they take in information so that we can get data into a function, let it do something to it, multiply it, uh, look it up on the internet, whatever the function is going to do, and then give us uh, some results. We're going to look at things called external variables. Those are variables that are known to many different functions because they actually are stored outside of where the functions store their variables. Those are automatics. We've already seen those like I and A and B and simple little variables like that. So we'll look at externals. We'll look at scope rules, which is how a variable hangs around. Does it need to be initialized? Does it get its own initialization done? And then uh, who can get to it? things like that. We'll see header files, how to use them. We've already seen how to do a pound include a standard I.O., but we'll look at other header files and, and what the, the different characters, the less than and the quotes and things like that mean. Static variables, we'll look at those, and register variables, which you may not get to use uh, in your particular compiler, but the C language still has the word for them for register variables, and I'll show you what they are in some in some compilers. We'll look at how to create a, a block structure in uh, in your functions and how to how to use such a thing. We'll also look at the initialization of variables and of uh, functions and, and other things in the program structure. Recursion, what it is, how to uh, avoid it if you want to, or how to enable a function to be recursive so that it can call itself and uh, not get into a uh, chasing its own tail kind of situation. And then finally in this section of videos we'll look at the C preprocessor, what it does for you and how you can use it to your advantage. So that's where we're going. Hang on and, and go on to the next video. Okay, let's take a look at the basics of functions. Defining functions, calling functions, uh, what functions are there for, how we can use them, a few things like that. First of all, why do we even have these things? Well, functions break up a program into some logical units of work. Uh, one of the nice things about the C programming language and the ability to have functions is that you can, you can separate the program mentally, logically, where you have some divisions. So if you think about an algorithm, I want to do this and this and this, three things in a row, or they happen asynchronously whenever some event occurs, like somebody presses a key on a keyboard or whatever, you can create those different units of work as separate functions and then call them whenever they need to, to be run. This also allows a development team to work separately. The development team can be spread around the world, which many are these days, and each part of the team can work on one or more functions, which then come together uh, into a module, and then all of those modules come together into the entire application or program that's, that's going to be released. Functions also allow you to independently test each of the functions. The lower and deeper into a program, the finer and finer small functions you can test, the better off you're going to be. It's uh, absolutely wrong to try to inspect in quality at the end of the job and try to test the whole big application at once. You need to test all of the individual small functions. You need to understand what is everything that could go into a function, what is everything that could come out of it, and then you can write a small calling uh, program uh, that can call the function with with every possible input and every possible uh, testing for every possible output and you understand if the function really works the way that you want it to. Then after you're done testing all of these different functions and compiling them into object code you combine them all together when you do your link step. What we do in the Windows compiler so far is uh, our CL, that's a compile and link together, and our GCC over in the, or our CC that we used you know, over in the Linux world did the same thing for us, did a compile and, and uh, the link step was, was all together. Now let's take a look at a small program here. 
this is is very simple. Uh, here's our main, and we don't even need our pound include standard I/O at the top. We're using printf, but we're not going to bother with it right now. Here's our main, open brace, close brace. That is a function definition for main and what is inside it. All that we do though is we call three separate functions, one after the other. Notice a call is different. Here we have main, open and close paren, no semicolon, and then an open brace. So we're defining what's in main. Here in func1, open and close parentheses, open and close paren, and a semicolon. So that makes this a statement. So we are calling or executing function 1. So statement of execution processing will come down here to func1, wherever it happens to be defined. Func1 is being defined down here with our open brace and close brace, and here's the contents of function 1. This is the statement called return, and I think we looked at this just a little bit before, but, but nothing in any detail. Return says to send back to the caller the value that's over here after a, a piece of white space. Printf, we already know that function a little bit, printf will return a number, which is the number of characters that it outputs when it does its job. So this just allows us to return a value. We're not going to do anything with it. We're not catching the value up here or anything like that. We're just printing out I am function 1, a new line. That's the end of the statement. That's the end of the function right there. And we come, our processing comes up to here. Function 2 gets called and executed. Processing will go down to function 2 when it's finished. We'll come back to function 3, perform it, and then we'll run off the end of main. And we could put an exit there or a return in main just as easily to return back to the operating system. Now what I want you to do is to stop the video here in just a second, and I want you to go create this small program. I called it func1.c, and I want you to create a func2 and a func3, just like this, right below your definition of func1, and make them do the same thing. Make them do a return, printf, I am function 2, I am function 3, and then compile and link the whole thing. Give that a shot, and when you get done with that, come back here and start the video again, and we'll go take a look at doing the same thing. Okay, so uh, go off and make that happen, and uh, I'll, I'll wait here for you. Well, that didn't take very long. I hope you actually did it. Uh, you will have learned a lot more if you uh, actually went off and, and did what I just told you to do. Let's flip over and take a look at, at my answer to our, our programming dilemma that we had to produce here. Here's our func1 and func2 and func3 calls to those functions. I'll spread them out a little bit so you can see what's going on here. Here's our definition of function1, just like we had uh, earlier. It's going to return the printf, I am function1. And here's func2 and func3 down here. Now, if we save this just like that, and then we go to our command line, and I have already saved it. I called it uh, func1.c, as you can see right there. And we compile and link it. And it does that. And we run it. There it, there it goes. I am function 1, 2, and 3. Now, how many of you had some problems with that? Maybe if you didn't put these things in quite right, let's say that we didn't have the return. If we leave that off and we do a file save, we'll come back here and compile the program. That's, there's some errors. That's what errors look like coming out of the compiler. If you're an excellent programmer, you'll never see these. If you're a normal programmer, you'll see programmer you'll see lots of these but here is uh, here's some problems here it says uh, func1.c line 13 warning function must return a value now it still produced our function one program but it gave us some warnings func1 must return a value and if I widen this a little bit maybe you can see uh, well I have it as wide as it'll go uh, func2 colon must return a value and those are just warnings because ANSI says that if you don't say otherwise, that these functions these functions should return values. Well, we're not returning anything because we took our return statement out of there. So that's, that's an issue. And uh, right now, the way these are defined, we expect a number to come back, but we never gave one back. Okay, so that's, that's a, a, a problem there. So if we put our return back in there, we can make that warning go away. Save it. 
whoops, we'll compile it again, and there we got rid of our warnings. And now we know that Funk One will work the way we wanted it to. There's other things that we're going to see here in this section in the next few videos about how we define functions and how we understand what is supposed to be inside these parentheses and what happens if we don't say anything. That's what we've done here is we've just created these function definitions. We didn't put any declarations at the top to help the compiler understand what's going to go in here and what's going to come out. So there's a lot more to understand about functions and, and how they're used. But at least you, you see what's going on now. Also understand that all of these functions, each individual one, could have been in its own source file. It could have been in function func one dot c, func two dot c, func three dot c, and then those files would have had all of the code and even possibly more functions in them. Each of them would have been compiled separately by our compiler, and then they we would have had some directives that would have linked them all together. So that's possible too, and that's how you start doing some big development projects and and spreading them all over the world by uh, having those source files able to be spread all over. So that's the basics uh, of functions, uh, just the, the beginnings. And now we're going to go take a look at some functions that return non-integers and uh, get a little, a little more complicated with the, whole, with the whole idea. So we'll come back here, and I'll see you in a few minutes. Well, you saw the uh, beginnings of functions and some of the basic uh, information about using functions. Uh, remember also that uh, one of the major reasons for using functions is so that you don't have to repeat yourself over and over again. You write a function once or somebody else writes it for you, and then you can use the function again and again without making your program any, any larger. It's just like a subroutine if you're familiar with other languages that use that, where you can do a go sub, then you go to the subroutine and perform the work and then return back to the caller. That's the same thing that's happening with a, with a function. Now, functions returning non-integers. When we looked at functions before, our func1, 2, and 3, they were going to return ints, uh, whether we said so or not. Now, in the new ANSI C, and that's from 1990 and later, so it's not so new, but uh, we still call it new style coding. If a function is not to return anything, it will be declared as being a, a void type. If you don't declare the function type at all, that's an integer type. And if you want it to return something that's not an integer, like a float or a double or a long double, you have to say so. You have to tell it that. So void functions don't return anything. An undefined function will return, can possibly return an int, not necessarily has to return an int, but could, and that's to allow older C programs to still compile and, and work properly. Let's take a look here at uh, a couple of different uh, function declarations, not definitions. Remember, the function definitions actually have the braces and all the statements in there. These are declaring these functions ahead of wherever they might be uh, used someplace in the program. Here we have function A, and it is declared to be an integer return type which we didn't really have to do, but it's good programming practice to put that on there so that you or somebody else can look at this program down the road and understand that func a will actually return an integer. Here we see that func a takes in an integer, and for uh, conversations, we'll just call it a, that it's going to be a. It doesn't ne necessarily have to be that in the code, but that's to uh, give ourselves a, uh, a placeholder here. It'll take in an integer, a character, and a float. And if you call it and pass it other things, if you put other uh, types in there when you actually make the function call, those other types will be cast, typecast, to these types because it's going to assume that you knew what you were doing when you were declaring the function. Here we have function B, and it's been cast as a float so that when func b does a return the value that is returned will be a floating point value and whoever is calling func b and catching a value like x equals func b in the call x has to be a float it has to be willing to catch this floating point value coming back here if x is not a float the, the recipient of the value from func b then it's going to get the return value is going to get stripped off because it's going to be typecast uh, from a float at, and stuffed into an integer, and that's going to strip information off of it. And here we have our, our same values that we had before. Now here, func c is not allowed to take anything in, and it's not allowed to give anything back. And if you 
attempt to use Funksy and call it inside your code and send it something in here, some value, the compiler will flag that as an error because you're messing up. You said that this is a void, so nothing should go in there. You said that nothing will come out, and if you do a return of any value out of Funksy, that will also not compile and will be an error. And that's a C trying to protect you from yourself. So to get a function to return a non-integer, you simply have to declare it as returning something other than an integer at some point before you actually define the function or uh, attempt to use the function. Let's take a couple of minutes now to talk about something called external variables. C programming has the concept of external and internal items. An internal item is something declared within a function. Now all functions are externals, are all external items because one function cannot be declared inside of another function. So therefore they are all at the external level. Variables however are places in memory where we're going to put things, different values, and they can be external or internal. What we have looked at so far are internal variables, our little integers and characters and a few floats and things that have always been defined uh, for the most part inside main, which itself of course is a function. So those have all been internal to main, and that means that other functions, func1, 2, and 3 that we wrote earlier, those functions cannot see those variables because the variables are contained, they're in encapsulated inside of main. So there's no way for those functions to get a hold of what's in those variables and do anything with them. Well that brings us to external variables. Now an external is only declared once per the entire program, but it may be referenced in all or many of the source files. It doesn't have to be referenced in all of them. It would only be referenced, of course, in a source file where a function in that source file was going to use the external. So here, you see, we have a little main, few little statements, but here is an external variable being declared. Here, it's an integer, and I called it evar. It's an external variable, a little semicolon. Uh, I was a bad programmer. I did not initialize it, but you know what? Externals, like that, are automatically initialized. They are given a zero value, so that uh, we don't have to deal with it. We should, but we don't have to. They will be set to zero when they're created. Now this is another source file over here. It's a totally different .c file, and it's going to have one or more functions and, and other things going on in it. We want to be able to reference down in here in func1 or 2 or 3 or whatever's over here, this evar. But we want to make sure when all of these are all combined together into a final program that we're only talking about this one place in memory so that main and the functions and all the rest of these pieces of work all reference a single global variable, a single variable that is external to all of the functions, but they all know how to get to it. And we do that by using the keyword here, extern. Extern int tells these functions within this one source file that there is something defined someplace else, and it's called evar, and it's an integer. So treat it as an integer and cast values appropriately, typecast them appropriately to fit inside an integer. But do not make up new storage. Do not set aside new memory for this thing called evar. Somebody else has already done it. Then at link time, when all of these uh, source files have been compiled into object code and everything is linked together, these will be references back to this identifier and this object wherever it is created in memory. Okay, so that's an external variable. And we're about to move on into something called scope, which is how long a variable hangs around and how it gets created and where it gets put in, in memory. So that is really going to tie into this. But I, I want to make sure you understand the concept of an external. Some languages call them globals. But the concept of an external variable being outside of all other functions. You'll have a problem if you come over here and make extern int the first time you declare it, because then you're telling main that somebody else declared it. So one time the external variable gets declared without the word extern, and then every other time that it's referenced, then that's where you use the word extern. Okay? Big difference. Hang in there. Let's go on to the next video.
Let's continue to talk about the scope of variables. The scope of a variable is when you can see it, when you can work with that particular variable, and how it's been defined and declared affect and define, I should say, uh, the scope of the variable. A variable has scope within the function that defines it. So when we had main and we had integer i or something inside main, that integer, that variable called i, uh, was local to main. No other function could see it. Only main could work with it. And it had scope until the closing brace of main. We saw just a little bit ago external variables. The external variables are the ones that were declared outside of any function. An external variable has scope until the end of the file that it is defined in, because the externs are outside any function, so the function braces don't matter to, to externs, only the file that they're defined in. And remember, we had to do an extern keyword if we wanted an extern that was defined in one file to be declared and used in another source file. There's a big difference there between definition or defining and declaring a variable. Defining it actually sets aside memory and storage. Declaring it just says, go find this thing. It's not created right here, but when you deal with it, it's an integer or it's, an, it's a float or whatever characteristics and type that the variable has. So we know how to deal with it. Then we'd let the linker figure out where the thing really is in memory. If you happen inside a function to create variables of the same name, shame on you, first of all. You shouldn't do that because it's very confusing. But if you do, the variables of the same name will win. The closest ones to you will win. So let's take a look here at what I mean by that. It's easier to, to see it in, in the code. Here's a, a quick little stub of main. And here we have an integer i. It's set equal to 0. And we test it. If i is equal to 0, it is. That's true. We're going to come in here. And now we can make a new integer i because we're inside a new code block. This is a almost like a function definition inside here, but it doesn't have any name. So we can create a new local automatic variable here, i, set it equal to something, and do whatever we want to with it. But when we do that, that will not affect this i. This is a new definition of i. Uh, it just happens to use the same name. Now, somewhere down here below the screen, there's a closed brace for this if block, and that's where i's scope ends. This i will go away at the closing brace of this if and it will no longer be in scope, and it will no longer exist in memory. Any value that it, that it had is lost. Okay, so this I is not, is not this one. This is a brand new I down here. And that is uh, one of the trickier things to know about scope, is you can do this, and scope only lasts within these braces. The scope of this I will only last until the ending closing brace of main, down here someplace. And if we created another variable up here, an external, that variable outside of any other function, that external, would only last for the length of this source file. It would only last for any of the uh, functions that were def defined in this. So that's talking about scope and the scope of a variable and how long a variable exists and how long it keeps its value. Okay, so that's scope. Header files. We've already seen the use of header files with our standard io.h, and I think we even use an std lib, a standard lib.h, a little earlier on. Header files are used in the C programming language to define other variables and information that is not generally functions. .c source files should contain function declarations for your program. Remember, you can have a whole bunch of different C source files, and your development team can work all over the world, and, and everyone works on their own source file and their own functions, compiles them, tests them, and so on, and then they're all brought together at the end to create a program. Well, the header files will contain all of the external variable declarations, like we just saw in talking about scope and externs, which would not generally be part of a C source file. The header files can be created one time, kept in a central repository, and then included, pound included, by the preprocessor. And we will see a lot more of the preprocessor later. It has its own 
section. Uh, the preprocessor will include the header files, which sets up all of the externs and other variables to be used by the various functions. Otherwise, we'd have to define those and repeat those definitions over and over again in every C source file, and you can be sure that we would mess it up eventually and misspell something, uh, just a typo or something like that. So the header files make it a lot uh, easier on us. The C language also comes with a number of header files, as we saw, standard IO, standard lib. There's a math.h, there's C type, there's a lot of .h's. And you can go looking through your compiler implementation and find in its library those header files and look through them and see the kinds of things that are defined in those headers that you can use later on. A lot of preprocessor directors, uh, I'm not going to talk about those because we haven't seen them yet and they won't make any sense at this point, but just know that header files are very important. They are used quite a bit and we will see that uh, a preprocessor can decide if a header has already been included. So every C source file can ask for the header file to be included again, but it will not be repeated over and over again throughout the, the program. It will only be brought in as necessary if you do the, the uh, includes properly when you set it up. Now take a look at this uh, uh, line of code here. This pound includes standard IO.h. We use the less than, greater than. That is really a preprocessor directive, but I want to talk to you about it right now. This tells the preprocessor to go look in the path, in the standard library path of where these header files are stored for the compiler. So that's defined to the uh, compiler when it's installed. And it's a usually an environment variable of if in the Windows world or, or a, uh, a setup in the uh, Linux world that tells it, uh, a link I should say, that tells it where that standard library is located. Now this one down here, this pound include, uses a double quotes. The double quotes tell the C compiler, don't look in your normal location. We are going to some other directory and we're picking up the included header files for this particular program. So that uh, double quotes is more specific about the location of the header file that's coming in. So header files are created to contain our variable declarations. You should not have functions in header files because you'll never get them compiled. The header files have to be included into something else before it can be compiled like into a .c source file. That's where your functions uh, should stay. So that's uh, just a little bit about header files, and we will be seeing more of them as uh, we create some code later on. Let's take a look at the concept now of static variables. This is a another keyword, another modifier to our definition and declarations that change how a variable is seen. And we know that's called its scope. If you make an external variable a static, so you could say, let's static int x, and to make an external, you put that outside any function definition. A static external will only be seen by its source file. None of the other files will get to see it. If there are multiple externals, and one is static and one is not, they will stay away from each other because they will actually be different places in memory. The uh, static external in a source file will only be visible within that source file. Now a static local variable, that's a static that's inside a function, will maintain its value. Remember we said automatics, if you make an automatic inside a function, whenever you come to that function, that automatic will be recreated it will occur again because it's occurring on the stack inside the uh, the computer inside the compiler. A static local variable gets put on the heap, not on the stack, so that it will stay around. Now, if you're not familiar with, with stacks and heaps and all that, that's okay. Just know that they are different places in, in memory and they're set up differently. Let me uh, break out of uh, PowerPoint here for a second so that we can go and look at some code. Here is a little function called funks.c and that has our main in it. So here we'll drop it down and here's what's going on. Here we reference func1, 2, and 3. We have to uh, declare them 
out here so that main understands that they exist in, a, in another source file. They don't exist here. So those are just external declarations of func 1, 2, and 3. Here we're saying that there are some external integers, variables 1, 2, and 3, that exist someplace else outside this source file. Here is another external which is uh, being declared and defined right here, int vm, that's the variable that's in main, and it's equal to zero. Here, these are just declarations, not definitions. We're declaring that we will use these external integers someplace else. Let's take a look here. This is func1.c, which is another little function, and it has the extern int vm, v2, and v3, because vm is uh, defined in main over here in funks.c and it is declared over here in func1.c. Extern int, these are declarations. This is a definition. We are defining v1 and setting it equal to 1 uh, when it's first defined. This is a compile time event, not a runtime event, and I'll prove that to you in just a minute. Honest. Here's func1, and it has a static integer fv1 and this is function variable 1. We're not going to do anything with it. I just wanted to as an aside show you what a static local looks like and anything that was done in fv1 down inside here would stay so that if we are in main and we come to func1 or 2 or 3 when we get back to func1 it would still maintain the last value in fv1 whatever was in there because it's noted as a static. Now here's func2, another pretty simple little file, and it has these declarations, extern ints, vm, v1, and v3, and it defines v2, and then we're going to print out what their values are. That's the same thing we do here. We print out, we're in function 1, and here's the value of vm, v1, v2, and v3, and there, and there they are. This wraps around a little bit, so let me drag that so you can see it. Well, it doesn't want to come over, but anyway, v2 and v3. Same thing in func2, same thing in func3, external declarations, one definition, and all of these have, have been saved to disk. So let's compile them, and this is what it looks like. Compile and link, funks, func1, func2, and func3.c. We just list the names in order of compilation and hit enter, and the compiler comes along, generates all the code, the object files, then the linker, Incremental linker picks it up and it's going to create funks exe because it uses the first C source file name for its executable. And there's funks and one, two, and three objects are all linked together. And all of these references tie these files together. Now, if we run funks, we'll see what happens. When we're in main, we start out and VM, that's this one here. This, you can see it just in the corner. VM equals zero. It is zero. But look at this. V1 is one v2 is 2 and v3 is equal to 3. We have not yet come down through this part of the code and done anything. We're at this first printf right here in main, right there. So these functions have not been called yet, but the external variables that were created like v3 already has its value because its value was set in memory when these things were created and initialized. They were set up at compile time not at runtime, so they already have values. Then function 1 comes along, and here we see what the values are, and they're starting to increment because I'm doing that over here. Here in main, I in increment v1 before I call function 1. So there we see in function 1, v1 is equal to 2 because it started out as 1. I incremented it, made the call, then I increment v2 here in main, and I call function 2, so function 2 is going to print out f2, v1 is still equal to 2, and it's defined over there in the other function, in function 1, but it's still equal to 2. It hasn't changed or gone away. v2 is now equal to 3, because it's jumped up 1. v3 is still 3, and over here, we're going to increment v3, and now it will be equal to 4, because they all had their initial values set, 0, 1, 2, and 3, and then they each incremented as they were supposed to, just like this, but the important thing to remember and what we're talking about here is the externals, the way they're declared, the way they're defined, and that they can be referenced across 
all different source files even though they were originally defined in other source files. It's all of this linkage that we have done with these keywords and with the static keyword to make these work properly. Now let me show you uh, something particular about static. Let's go here to func3. And here we have this external integer uh, v3 is equal to 3. If I make it a static, I'm going to cause an error. That's a static int v3. Static int v3 will only be visible to this func3 source file. It will not be visible to these other source files anymore. That's going to create an error because I'm looking for an external int called v3 and it's no longer going to exist because by making it a static external int definition here it's going to disappear and we'll ignore our mail over there let's get rid of that sorry folks here we go let's save this file save and come over here and compile there we go Oh, look at that. Unresolved external symbol, v3, referenced in function main. And here's another link, unresolved external symbol, v3. That's in the function 1 object. The function 2 object fails because it has an unresolved external symbol, v3, and it cannot go on. It can't uh, do this. There's an unresolved external because v3 disappeared because of this static keyword. We'll delete that back out of there, save the file back, recompile it, whoops, too far, recompile it, there it compiled cleanly, and it all runs again. So when you make an external definition, when you make it static, it is only visible to that source file. None of the rest of the code will be able to see it at that point. So that's a way of making a variable somewhat global. It will be global to these functions in this C source, but it will not be global and visible to all of the other functions throughout the program. Sometimes you need that. You, you don't want to make a variable any more visible than it really has to be. Let's bring our slide back up, and we covered everything in there. So that is static variables and tying together some things about externs and how they're defined and declared. I hope it was some good information for you. So let's move onward. Just going to take a minute here to talk about uh, a special kind of variable called a register variable. In some C compilers, uh, when you ask for a register variable, you, you really would get one. And, and that could still happen today, uh, depending on the platform that the compiler is on. By the C standard, though, a compiler does not have to give you a register. Usually, in today's world, there just aren't that many registers available for your use. And the compilers are honestly smarter than we are about how to optimize and when to use a register and, and when not to. Now, if you're doing some programming, embedded programming, and you're writing code for an automobile or an appliance or some small device like that that you have complete control over the the machinery uh, you may very well be able to create uh, one or more register variables but in today's large operating system compilers like uh, the windows the c++ that we're using and, and the uh, gcc on on linux you're not likely to get a register what you are telling the compiler though in today's world is that this will be a high use variable it's something that you're going to rely on a lot you're going to use it in a loop or something like that you're going to use it for some uh, timing and the point is that you will be putting information into it, incrementing it, decrementing it, somehow dealing with this variable quite a bit. Uh, again, uh, you're telling it it's a high use. You're not guaranteed to get a real register. And here's just a quick little stub to show you how it works. Open brace, register int r equals zero. And here we're going to use it a hundred times and, and print out uh, the value of r. No big deal, obviously, but this is how you say that you want to an integer to be stored in a register. Again, absolutely no guarantee that you're really going to get a register, but what's the harm in trying? The compiler will just ignore you and go on and will use the registers for what it sees fit. I want to uh, reiterate uh, some things I said about the block structure of C earlier. Uh, statement blocks can hide variable definitions inside them. Remember when we had an integer i 
that was above a statement block and then we did an if and went down inside it and we created another I. Well, that inner I that was created inside the statement block was completely separate from the one that was above it. So statement blocks can be containers and encapsulate some other information down inside them so that that information is not uh, modified by or referenced by higher functions uh, above it, or higher functionality, I should say, not to confuse that with functions. When you start to look at C++, you're going to see some of these kinds of concepts uh, occurring with encapsulation and uh, private variables and things that, that you can't get to from the outside world. So uh, keep an eye out for that sort of thing. Identically named variables within other functions will be hidden down in there. Now let's let's take a look at this uh, little piece of code here. Here we have an integer x and an integer y. We know that those are externs because they're declared outside of f of our function, or they're externals. If we uh, needed to uh, declare them someplace else, we would of course use the extern keyword. But here we're defining them as integers x and y, so we don't use the keyword. Now here we have uh, f, which is going to take a double uh, value, uh, a floating point double of x as a, a parameter passed into it. This x will become a local automatic variable only contained within the function f. It will not be and is not a reference to this integer x out here. This is a whole different animal. Down in here we have a new local called y which is also cast as a double type to be a double and it is set equal to the value of x that was passed in here this y and x have nothing to do with that one because we have created new definitions down here new y's and x's and are not relying on these definitions outside this brace that's the door that's the container or the open and the closed braces which separate us off from this x and y here. And here we're going to return y times x. Now f would have had to have been uh, defined as uh, returning a type double because uh, if we don't say so it's just going to return an int. And uh, y times x are both doubles and it's going to be a problem because we're going to strip some data off of there. Strip a whole bunch of bits off of it when uh, that uh, double value gets shoved through an integer return path. So this is what we want to show you in block structure and reiterate that the C language is not a specific block language like a Pascal, but it does in fact have uh, the block structure somewhat by using these braces. We've uh, already been talking about initialization as we've created a, a whole bunch of variables, uh, external, automatics, uh, statics, registers, uh, all sorts of other things as we've been doing this, but let's uh, focus on it here for just a second. Extern and static variables, if they are to be initialized by you, by the programmer, they have to be initialized with a constant because remember, those things happen at compile time. When we had our four different functions in, in different source files and they had v1, 2, and 3, uh, whatever the variable names were. Remember that we saw them all initialized before we ever referenced them, before we ever did anything with them. So those initializations were done when the compiler was going through the code and creating the object code. So those have to be constant definitions, constant initializations, because the compiler is not performing the program. It's not running the program and figuring out what these uh, different numbers should be. It only has uh, what is stored in the source code itself. That's why extern and static definitions are constants, or initializations are constants. Automatics and registers, because they're stored on the stack, they are simply placeholders on the stack at the time that function is running. So if you don't explicitly initialize them with something, they'll get whatever junk is left on the stack. They'll get undefined garbage that's laying there. Uh, they can be initialized with with a mathematical calculation with an arithmetic operation because they are only initialized during the functioning, the the running of the program. So take a look at our little piece of code here. There is an extern x being, being uh, defined out here, and it will be zero. 
because we're not giving it any value. So by setting it aside on the heap, the compiler is required to clear out its memory uh, because we don't know what's going to be there. Here we have an integer y, and we set it equal to 1, and that will be done when the program is compiled. 1 will be set in this place in, in memory so that when things are loaded up and all of this data is set for operation before any function ever begins uh, execution, these values will be taken care of. Down in here, this is an automatic uh, called i. Since we didn't set it to anything, we didn't initialize it, it will be undefined garbage because it is on the stack and we don't know what's right there at the top of the stack where this thing is going. And here we have another integer z, and we're allowed to do this. We can say x plus 2, which we know is 0, so that'll be 2, times y plus 1, which is 1, and uh, we'll also have another one added to it. So that's 2 times 2. So z has 4 in it, and this will be done as one of the first statements of mains functioning. This is really just shorthand. It doesn't matter if you say int z semicolon and then you say z equals this down here uh, because it's going to do exactly the same amount of work. It's a little better to put this right here I think because it uh, gets it out of the way and you know that z doesn't get forgotten someplace down inside your program. It has an initialized value and you don't go tripping over garbage or, or something that's uh, there that you don't expect to be there. So that's uh, covering initialization of uh, all the different types that we've looked at, externs, statics, things that are outside the, uh, the uh, functions will be initialized with constants. Automatics and registers get garbage just because of where they're located. They're put on the stack rather than the heap. And that is our coverage of specific coverage of initialization. Recursion is a very powerful concept that is when a function can call itself. Some functions are not recursive just because of the way they're written, but uh, most would be. And if you start out to create a function that will, will be recursive, that will wind up calling itself, there's a few things you need to be aware of. One, excessive recursion can cause great problems because you generally will be working within a limited amount of stack space. The stack can be overflowed or even underflowed if things are popped off incorrectly. Uh, that's generally not under your control, but you can overflow the stack with uh, excessive recursion. Let's say that you're sorting a very large array or something like that, and you're, you've written your own sort, your own re recursive function, which calls itself. Every time you do the call, more variables are pushed onto the stack, which is where you're setting up all of your locals and automatics, and you can wind up with an issue. You're probably not going to be doing that kind of coding for some time, if ever, if you ever have to get into that, but I uh, just want you to be aware of it. But recursion is when a function calls itself. Now here we have right out of KNR a little function called uh, print D. Now print D takes in an integer n and it's going to print it out uh, as a decimal. We know that printf does that for us, but we like to reinvent the wheel around here. Here's what print D is going to do with this integer that it gets in. If the integer is negative, if the, new, the number that it's being asked to print is less than zero, the first thing we'll do is stick out a negative, a minus sign. And then we will flip n. We will say that n equals negative n, which will flip it over to a positive. Now we get out of that if, and now we start working on a positive number. If it was not negative, of course, we, we hit down into here. If n divided by 10 has a whole value here, in other words, the n is larger than 10, and it's over in the tens place, or hundreds, or thousands, it's a larger number, then we're going to call ourselves we will call ourselves with n divided by 10 and get that number down smaller. If the number is 1, 2, 3, and 4, it's too large for us to print one character at a time. So we divide it by 10 and call ourselves again. Check it to see if it's 0, it's not, if it still can be cut down. Uh, we divide it by 10, call ourselves again and again until eventually we're dealing with a single digit. We're not dealing with a double digit value. When that happens, we put care and modulo 10, so that's the remainder of n divided by 10, plus a character 0. Uh, a character 0 added to the actual value number will create the ASCII printable character. 
so we put out the printable character and then we return from print D. Well, if there were multiple print D's calling each other, when we return from print D, we actually return to here, the, the next statement after the last time we called print D. And this put care will then be, be performed, which is the next digit in, say, 1, 2, 3, 4. We would have printed out the 1, and now we print the 2, and then we'll exit here, come back into the next statement after the call for the number 3, exit, the number four will be printed, and then finally we will wind our way back out of this recursive set of steps and leave print D entirely. But that is recursion, and recursion is a function turning in on itself, calling itself repeatedly, and it's a good thing to remember that you don't want excessive recursion. It can blow off the stack, and uh, it's a very powerful part of C programming, though. The C preprocessor is actually a totally separate process that occurs before compilation. And in our uh, compile and link, or our CL in Microsoft, and also in our CC, you can set a switch to only preprocess the source file. You might want to just make sure that things are syntactically going to work properly properly. Uh, with the preprocessor statements and not bother with all the rest of the compile. So you can, you can just run the preprocessor step. Uh, we don't have a lot of call for that, but it's good if you're debugging a, a large source source file. The preprocessor is uh, responsible for file inclusion with the pound include. We've seen a lot of that. Macro substitution. We've seen a little bit of that with the pound define. And also conditional inclusion with uh, various forms of, of uh, pound if. We'll look at those here in a second in another slide. So let's say uh, what we've already worked with, pound include standard io.h, that's, that's pretty reasonable. We looked at the less than, greater than, and the double quotes before to show the difference of including the standard io.h out of the typical installation dependent location where header files are stored, as opposed to using double quotes here, which uh, starts in the directory containing the .c source file that, that we're inside of here, and then it will go on from there to uh, implement implementation-dependent paths that might be used to store C source. Here's a very simple define of uh, the letters PI to be this number, 3.14159, and uh, we normally make these constants like this as uppercase so that you can see them when you're working with them in the code. So that if you set something equal to pi in the capital PI, it's actually going to be replaced before the code is ever compiled with this number. Those uh, letters will never make it through to the compiler. Now here's an actual small function that's being defined for macro substitution. Again, we use the uppercase to keep this consistent so that if you see a function call, it kind of will look like a function call with the parentheses and all. You'll understand since it's uh, all uppercase and that's your own convention that that's not really a function call. It's a macro substitution. What we've said here is that if somebody uses this sequence of characters, uh, max and two variables uh, with a comma between them, what we will do is substitute whatever's in this position and this position, A and B, into this sequence of characters, A and B. And uh, th this is our old comparative operator. Uh, we have a test over here, and if the test is true, we take this value, and if the test is false, we take that value. Uh, remember that, A uh, in this case, we're going to use is A greater than B. If it is, return A. If it is not, return B. And that's our max function. If we actually used max down inside uh, our program someplace, it would look like this. Say max X plus Y and F plus G just for conversation's sake. What would be substituted is X plus Y would be substituted where A was. So it comes in here and in here. And F plus G gets substituted into this set of parens. So this arithmetic operation will be performed and we'll do a comparison and see uh, if it's true x plus y will be returned as the max value and if it's false uh, then we know this is the larger one and f plus g will be returned now you have to be careful about doing this because wherever you use this thing in your code this is what's going to come in to your source code before the compile happens. If you really use this a lot, you should make it a function and just call it as a function. Because if, if you use it a lot and use this kind of macro substitution, you're going to wind up uh, creating a lot of extra code 
because a function is just created once and then you call it, this substitution is created over and over and over again uh, throughout your source code. So it's something to be aware of. Now here's conditional inclusion. Uh, in this case, if a previously defined preprocessor value called system is equal to another previously defined value like sysv or sys5, then we'll define our header hdr value as sysv.h. Else if, ELIF, else if system equals BSD, we'll pound define the header as BSD.h, else if MSDOS, define the header as MSDOS, and then a final else, notice this works just like the if and else if uh, that we had in the C language itself, else we'll pound define header as default.h. Then we have an end if that closes this up, and we include whatever header is defined as now, which is in that case, default h, or it could have been any of these values based on what the system value was as we came into this preprocessor set of statements here. So that's conditional inclusion. And we also have a nice item called if not defined, and this stops redefinition. Let's say that inside the header.h file, we can do an f if ndef. If not defined header, then go ahead and, and do these statements. Define header and do other things that header dot h is supposed to do for us and then that's the end of our if. If you make sure to wrap all of the statements of your header files and things like that you can include the header file over and over and over again in all of your C source files but it will only wind up being expanded once because the HDR header will be defined or whatever your variables are, whatever your name is that you use in the in the header files. And it, it stops redefinition and it helps the preprocessor move along and get the job done a little quicker. So that's some uh, the, the basics of the preprocessor. Pretty simple yet very powerful. So moving right along.